Hi everyone, Plastic P here from Melbourne, Australia. And I've got a very special guest from Liverpool. Where else would you come from? Colin Hall. How are you today, Colin? I'm very good, Plastic. How are you? I'm very well. Now listen, you, you've got a few claims to fame. First of <laughs> oh, all, yeah. you've looked after Mendips for the last 17 years. That's correct, isn't it? I looked after Mendips 17 years, yep. Yeah. And you're still doing that today, aren't you? Well, I would do, except for the pandemic. Um, but, you know, as soon as we can social distance, uh, the houses will be open again. Fantastic. Now, you helped write a book. Let's have a look at that book and tell me about the book, because that's what we're here for. Okay, let me read it. Prefab, Colin Hanton with Colin Hall. That's you. And I'm looking at the picture there of the um, quarrymen with John. Is that right? Yeah. Fantastic. That, that's the quarryman at a place called Rosebury Street, which isn't too far from here. And of course, Colin Hanton was the drummer in uh, John Lennon's original skiffle group, The Quarrymen. He played with them for mm, around about three years. Uh, he, uh, he participated in the recording of uh, In Spite of All the Danger. Um, uh, and on that uh, record, uh, Paul played with uh, the Quarrymen, as did George Harrison. So, and it's on the, both sides are on the anthology. anthology yeah, I've heard one. it. It's fantastic yeah. with Paul singing. I actually like that song, in spite of all the danger. And apparently, someone had the last copy and then Paul bought the last copy, didn't he? Well, there was only ever, there oh. was only ever one copy. It's an amazing story. It was a piece of shellac. Uh, one copy only, because that's all the boys in the band could afford to record. And um, it was record, recorded just a few days before John Lennon's mother, Julia, died. Oh, that's sad. And the euphoria behind making the record kind of evaporated. And the idea had been that all the boys in the band would take a turn in looking after the record and playing it, you know, and that. And anyway, it ended up with a friend of Colin Hanton's. And that friend um, looked after it for a while. And then it ended up with the keyboard player in the quarryman. And he basically kept it for the best part of 30 years in his sock drawer. <laughs> and um, eventually, he realized that there was quite a market for Beatles memorabilia. So he approached Sotheby's with the idea of putting it up for auction. Anyway, it never went to auction because Paul McCartney uh, kind of got in touch with the uh, keyboard player whose name is Duff Lowe. And they organized a private uh, deal and uh, it, it, it ended up with Paul. Okay, and good man. I just want to say that's a 78 shellac, isn't it? So you've got to play it on 78. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And how the hell it didn't break. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a big tight. record too. 78 are pretty thick. 10 inch, yeah. Yeah. They're good mm -hmm. man. You know all about this stuff. You're, you're a right, bit of yeah. an engineer. All right. Now let's get off that story. And let's talk. Because you've got the book there, I just want to know. Is there a movie behind the book, is there? Well... Amazingly, amazingly, there is. I'm amazed. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I am. <laughs> you know, um, a, a guy from America came over. He did the tour of the house. He did a bit of a tour of Liverpool with Col Hampton. And he, he bought a copy of the book, went home. And the next thing we knew, he wanted to um, fund a, a full length, a feature length documentary of the film. So that's what's happening at the moment. And um, it's, it's being turned into a, a 90 minute uh, documentary. And it, it's, it's quite interesting because the final scenes in the movie were, were shot in um, Abbey Road because the filmmakers thought what a great idea to climax the movie uh, we'll get the quarrymen together again and we'll take them to, quarry, uh, to, to Abbey Road. <laughs> so um, things come full circle, you know, and uh, it's, it, 
it's the story of Colin's life with the group. So it's all from his perspective. Um, and it just throws a bit of insight, I think, into those formative years of how John allows Paul into the group and how Paul's personality starts to um, influence the way the group uh, is run. And I, I think Paul uh, was always the one who had that little bit more energy to, uh, to move things on. Maybe John, because the original quarrymen were all his friends from school, he did find it a little bit difficult to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we have a better guitarist. His name is George. Um, and, and so anyway, it, it, it just shows a little bit of an insight into how that the, dy the dynamism, the, 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 the way that Paul and John work together. Uh, uh, I've also got to say, you know, a very good friend of mine is Michael A. Hill, who gave him uh, the well, Tutti Frutti record to listen to. You're familiar with uh, Michael? Oh, yes, I am. He's visited Mendips. He's a very, he, very good author. He's got a book out called John Lennon, the boy who became a legend. And that has, story is unbelievable. He has. I've read that book. I, I actually reviewed that book for um, a magazine. Uh, I like it very much. And it, it's, you know, it's what I do at Mendips. My job is to tell the childhood story of John Lennon. Um, at, through to his teens and being a Beatle, but books like Michael's, you know, are invaluable resources because these aren't just people putting stories together. These are eyewitnesses. And, you know, eyewitnesses are getting fewer on the ground. <laughs> We're all I'm getting old. i to say something to you, to you, Colin. I was fortunate enough to be invited to Michael's house to actually do a documentary, his story. Yeah. And I've got that and I'll send you the link. So that's pretty yep. fascinating that he invited me, Plastic EP, to spend yep. time with him to tell the story. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, he's, you know, uh, who else can tell those stories? No one. That's why we're no here talking to you. Yep. I'm here to yep. document your story, Colin. And that is true. Because let me explain yep. to you. In 20 years' time, they want to know who the person was there for nearly 20 years looking after Mendips and what stories he's got. Now, you've just opened up the can of worms now, and I want to ask you, a lot of celebrities have come through Mendips, and I want yes, to start off with a Peter Talk story, if you can. A what story? Peter Talk came to the house. Yeah, I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, Peter Talk from the Monkees? Peter Talk, <laughs> You know what? You've got, you've got a bit of an accent. Where are you from? Australia, not Mars. Oh, God. God. All right. I knew you weren't from Liverpool. Sorry. I'm not from the pool. Peter Talk. Peter Talk came to Mendips. Um, and of course, you know, I'm, I remember the monkeys. Who doesn't remember the monkeys? But they don't look like they used to or, or they... Uh, they've grown facial hair and they've lost hair and uh, they've become disguised by age. And I didn't, I didn't recognize him to begin with, but uh, I, I cottoned. It took me a while for the penny you, to drop. You cottoned um, th This is Peter Talk. And that was kind of odd, you know, for me, because the monkeys, the whole thing was based on the Beatles. Of course. And it, I felt it was quite a quite an honour for for the, um, for us that Peter visited Mendip. So I was really pleased. Did you and, talk um, to him? Only briefly, because you know you've got fifteen people in front of you, and uh, you're guiding them. Then they have a little look around by themselves, and they come up to you with questions. They always, you know, want to know stuff. So you don't have time to form a relationship or get into a deep conversation because you're on a time scale. Um, but I did speak to him uh, it, briefly. Don't ask me what we talked about because- You forgot. I, I have forgot. But I, I'm, I most probably told him I appreciated uh, the monkeys because I do. I, That's I, great. You know, I'm glad because the all the monkeys groups will be watching this and they're going to love it, especially one called Zilch. 
in the U.S. Right. Okay, well, hello, Zilch. You should tell You can be a Zilcher. You should join yeah. him on Facebook. You'll love it. I'm one of their biggest fans. Yeah, right. Okay, well, you know, they, they made some great records. I, my personal favorite is Last Train to Clarksville. I, I just think that's a, uh, just a, you know, that's a classic record. I know I'm a believer uh, was the, possibly the biggest hit here in UK, but I think Last Train to Clarksville uh, was just, there was just something magical about that record. Yep, and Louis Sheldon played the guitar lick for that song, and he lives in Queensland. Oh, right. He's with the Wrecking Crew. A lot of people live in Australia. Like Michael A. Hill, he doesn't live too far from me either. Right, okay, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> I'll have to pop over and say hello. Please, come on down. Now, listen, oh. all right, I'm glad you mentioned Peter Talk now. Bob Dylan came. Tell me about that. Well, that was... If I have to be honest, I think of all the people who visited Mendips who are, who we might call celebrities, I think the visit of Bob Dylan is, is the, for me, the absolute, that was it, you know, because for me, he's, he's one of the, if not the greatest songwriter. It was like Shakespeare. For me, it was like Shakespeare coming to the house. Of course. And so consequently, um, it was a wonderful moment. Now, unlike Peter Talk, who came as part of a regular group of 15, Bob Dylan came as part of a regular group. He didn't stand on ceremony. He didn't, I didn't know he was coming. But the group he arrived with, there were only two other people. So I was able to... Um, kind of connect with Bob uh, in the sense that could have a little bit of conversation. But essentially, you know, when people come to Mendips and Bob Dylan was exactly like this, he's not coming to say, hey, I'm Bob Dylan. He, he's, he's saying, I've come to Mendips because I want to hear the story. I want to know what went on here. So my job is always to deliver the tour and the stories and to answer questions. And that's exactly what I did with Bob. And he, he did ask questions. He wanted to know where, Bob, uh, where John might play his guitar, where he might do his writing, if he liked to spend time in the garden. He, he had all sorts of questions and was fascinated to see things in the house that he could relate to being in his house as a child growing up in Hibbing, in, uh, it was in Minnesota, right? And um, it was Minnesota, yeah, you know, terrible, terrible memory. Um, so that was fascinating. And at one stage, uh, we were in John's bedroom. And what took his interest there was uh, on John's bed, we have a few books that he loved as a child. I think, you know, these might be mentioned in Michael's book. But anyway, we have a few books. And one of John's great loves as a, a young lad was a, a writer called Richard uh, or Rickmull, Rickmull Crompton. And, um, and uh, Rickmull was a woman, but she, she originally wrote under the name of Richard, but then she changed to her proper name, Rickmull Crompton. And she wrote the stories of Just William, who was a middle-class schoolboy, forever in trouble with figures of authority. He had a gang. And they were always up to mischief. And they were called the Outlaws. And John Lennon had a gang that he called the Outlaws as a young lad. And, um, and Bob saw this book on the bed by Rickmull Compton, and it was one of the Just William stories. And that's what he wanted to know about. Who's, who's Just William? What's that all about? So that's the kind of information he wanted to know. And um, for a moment, as I stood in John Lennon's bedroom and I was talking with Bob, it did just strike me as surreal that here I was talking to a guy who I consider to be like Shakespeare. And I'm talking to him in John Lennon's bedroom and John Lennon is one of my all time heroes. And it, it, it just was a moment when I, had to step back, you know, literally and think, 
I can't believe this is happening. It was just, just magical, just magical. And, and he was such a, 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 a nice guy, Bob Dylan, you know, he, he was there for the history. And I thought that was great. And what I also thought was great, he didn't stand on certain, he came on the bus, <laughs> on the little tour bus. We have a little tour bus and we bring our guests on that bus. And that's how he came to the house. And um, I thought that was, that said a lot about him. That's amazing. Now, what other big celebrities have come in, like come through the house the, while you were there? Well, Colin Hanton of yeah. the Quarry, <laughs> of the Quarry Man. Um, but big celebrities, well, it, 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 you know, I've, I've entertained, hosted people like Bonnie Raitt, um, James Taylor. Yeah, that's big. Jackson Brown. Yeah, that's big. Um, uh, I'm sure there's people who are going to say after this, you never mentioned me. Um, Blondie. Uh, oh, yeah. Did Deborah Harry come? Deborah Harry came, yeah. She came. That's um, amazing. When did she come? It'd be about five years ago now, I think. She told you? Of course, yeah. What did she say? Uh, Mask. <laughs> well, she again was there for the history. Of course. And she she came with Cle Clem. Chris, I think, is it or Clem? Clem, the drummer. Okay, that's fine. That's Clem, yep. Yeah. And uh, they were they were they were wonderful because they were on tour in uh, Liverpool. They were playing that night, and um, I'd met Clem before. Clem Burke, yeah, the drummer. Right. That's you know, you're blondie. Yeah. Well, they're a great group. You know, they made some amazing singles, and um, Clem. It was Clem who organised, and. What my wife and I did was to bring them to the house privately. Um, and my wife at that time was looking after Paul McCartney's house. So we, we gave them a little tour of each house. And they were, they were wonderful. And got talking with, with, with them and mentioned that I was raising a bit of money for Cancer Research UK. And the next thing I knew, a box arrived and it was uh, all signed memorabilia, photographs, drum skins from Blondie. That's amazing, uh, isn't it? Because so, how much you know, they care. That, well, yeah. And, you know, we raised thousands with those pieces that they Of sold. course. Yeah. So, and even better, I knew, <laughs> I knew Debbie was going to be there. And Cancer Research had given me a guitar, not, not to keep, um, but somebody had donated this pink Gibson. And they said, we've got this guitar and we can auction it, but it, if ever there's anybody comes by who would sign it. And so I had this guitar and, was, and, and Debbie came by and I just asked. Of course. And I bet you she said yes. She did. There you go. I, you don't ask. It, 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 she, she was she was just wonderful, you know. She didn't think twice, but you know, um, I, again, that's the measure. Of, of course. Of, did you have um, roast beef? <laughs> what did you have for dinner? What did I have for dinner? I'm a vegetarian. No, I'm saying, did you feed him? You gave him a dinner, didn't you? No. Oh, you didn't give him dinner. Sorry. No, no. Well. They were on a schedule, they had a sound check, you know, so... Um, Fair enough, sorry. Yeah. I just thought, you know, you're going to have the Liverpool dinner, you know? That would be Scouse. Okay. Scouse. What's a Scouse, Scouse. dinner? A Scouse, it's something, it's a real name is Lob Scouse, but we call it Scouse. That's why Liverpoolians are called Scousers. You know, it's one of my friends in Liverpool is David Bedford, don't you? Oh, right. Yeah, no, I saw David Bedford this morning, actually. He was at an unveiling of a statue of John Lennon. That's right. Penny Lane. And I saw him there. I, I didn't speak to him, but I saw him. But I know David. That was live on the net. I just saw it. Amazing, isn't it? I'm not even in Liverpool. We do a yeah. show called The Bedford Report. 
Oh, right. You got to catch up and watch that, Gollum. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, listen, I'm going to ask you if I came to Liverpool with David Bedford and we wanted to see, let's say, Mendips, because you're in charge of Mendips, and who's in charge of Paul's house? Well, it was my, my wife, Sylvia, until recently. She's re re retired, you know. I'm, we're, we've just had, uh, our daughter's just had um, her, her first child, and Sylvia wants to help look after uh, our first child. And, and so, I've got to say, 17 years, right, looking after Mendips, that's, cor that's correct? Yeah, and nine of those, I lived in the house. And what was it? Can I ask you? Now, I'm being serious. Did anything happen in the house in the nine years that you were there that was a bit strange? And I'm being serious. Well, I say no. Well, the, the thing that happened, I'm not, I'm not someone, I don't think I have a psychic bone, you know, I don't. No, that's all right. Um, but Julian Lennon opened uh, an exhibition in Liverpool called the White Feather Exhibition, uh, an exhibition of his personal memorabilia. And he said that it was called White Feather because his dad had said to him, you know, whatever happens, you'll know I'm there if you see a white feather. And I think somebody in New Zealand, the Maori uh, chief, gave um, it, it gave Julian a white feather. Anyway, he called it white feather. And um, I didn't. I didn't, well. All I can say is that when the day before the exhibition opened, we had a white bird, a dove, visit the house. He just landed on the back garden. And when I went out, there was a white feather. That's amazing. And I also uh, say, when the three beetles got together, there was a white bird near the tree while they're taking promotion photos too. Do you, you're familiar with that too? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I will go back and have a look and double check that. <laughs> no, it's true. When they regrouped yeah. and they took photos, it's near a tree, it's on the internet, there's a white bird there. And the three beetles look at the bird. Well, you know, that... That dove, that white dove, was a regular visitor to the garden that summer whilst the exhibition was on. And it, it, it was uncanny. And um, when I moved out of Mendips and went to live in my house, which is only just down the road from Mendips, I only live four or five houses from Mendips. <laughs> this is going to sound like I'm making it up, but it's absolutely... Well, you're not true. making it up. On the doorstep the day we moved in, white feather. Back garden, a dove. So, um, what can I say? You've said enough. I believe you. I, be I believe you. These things yeah. happen. We've got no control over things. And that's a story. Like, have you told that story to anybody else or have you told it the first time to me? Only, only to my friends because I, okay. I, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. You know? No, no, but this is what the first time you're saying it publicly? Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, can I ask I mean, you any more? No, I mean, <laughs> I would love to think, you know, it was something, but I'm a, I'm a scouser. <laughs> no, that's all right. Is there any other... We're going on this now because it's a very interesting subject. Mm. Is there anything else that's happened in that house when you were there, while you stayed there, that you thought that was a bit strange? Well, um, a coinc coincidence, we have a clock in the house that is quite special. It's a replica of um, the, the, the clock that was always there when John was there. It's Uncle George's clock. And Yoko Ono Lennon very, very kindly donated the replica. I think the original hangs in the Dakota. And I think it's obviously got huge sentimental value because it was something that John asked Aunt Mimi to send to him um, from, uh, from uh, what she had from Mendip. She, he said, Uncle George's clock, that's the sound, you know. 
So Yoko told the National Trust that you can't really have Mendips without Uncle George's clock. And she very kindly had a, a replica made for us for the house. And um, anyway, the clock worked perfectly. I wound it whenever it needed winding and it just ticked away. And then one time uh, it stopped and it just wouldn't go. And it stopped at nine o'clock, uh, which uh, for me was kind of symbolic because nine is that number that is associated with John Lennon. That's true. Did it stop at nine o'clock, did it? It stopped at nine o'clock. You know? On the dot? On the dot. Okay, well, that, there's no more crime right there. That's, that's a story in itself. Number nine, number nine. It's amazing. I mean, you, you can read into this what you want. That's right, I, but at least you tell it. I, I think it's a coincidence, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice coincidence. It's a good coincidence. I totally understand what you're telling me, and I think people out there need to hear these stories. Mm. So anybody else come along? I really like the Blondie story. That's a beauty. Well, you know they were great. Well, we, uh, I mean, we've had artists like Paul Brady. I don't know if you know Paul Brady. He's a, he, he wrote many songs. He wrote a particularly famous one for uh, Tina Turner. I don't know. Um, but we get, uh, I know at the gate, he didn't come in. But I know um, Al Pacino turned up on a on a taxi tour, but I didn't know he was there. But he's turned up. We get people arrive all the time. Kasabian, I think, came to the house one time. Um, the Eels. Have you heard of Eels? Yeah. Great band. Yeah. They, they've been rock set. Um, yeah, I've heard of them. They're great. Yep. Yeah, um, the the gentleman that took the photograph of John in his New York cut off, you know, sleeves of, gosh, forgotten his name. <sighs> Terrible, it's because I've not been at work because of the c coronavirus. But he, 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 he's been um, numerous people. What I should do one day is sit down and write a list. Um, but I don't tempt fate. I think if I start writing the list, then they'll stop coming. Can I ask you, did they sign a book when they come in? Some of them do. James Taylor did. Blondie, um, she signed? She signed. She, I, have a little, um, I have a little book of my own, and sometimes they'll sign that for me. So um, Klaus Vorman, you know Klaus? You've heard of, of Klaus. Course. Klaus signed it for me. Um, in fact, Klaus did a little drawing of me uh, and signed it. So I felt very honoured for right. that. Um, I should refer to that because that will uh, will tell me who's who's been that I've forgotten. Uh, unfortunately, I've reached that age when my memory is no longer my strong point. I don't think this, it ever was. You know? Yeah, but this is why you're here to say whatever you need to say. Well, you can. You know what I mean. You look back on this in 20 years and go, "I did the interview at Plastic, and I remember now what I told you." So it's really good. Now I've got to ask you: 60th anniversary of a special event. They, they, they don't have television and computers in heaven, do they? Because that's where I'll be in 20 years' time. But um, <laughs> I'll, call in. I'll say, hey, God, you. God, come over here. That's me. <laughs> that's me on the computer. But sorry, go on. Now, there was a special event that happened yesterday, 60th anniversary. Do you want to tell me about that? Yes, yeah, the 60th anniversary of uh, the Beatles standing on stage in the Indra Club in Hamburg for the first time and performing, you know, when they went over with Alan Williams. Um, so it would be Pete Best, Stu Sutcliffe, George, Paul and John. Um, so very special occasion because um, I think to paraphrase John Lennon, uh, the Beatles were born in Liverpool, but they were made in Hamburg. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said but it was words uh, to, to that effect. And so you couldn't really, you, you know, put too much. I think 
I think Mark Lewison, a really great author of the Beatles, um, he, he said, you know, Hamburg is where the Beatles found their feet, where they found uh, their voice. Um, and so they were, they visited Hamburg quite a few times over a period of uh, two and a half years. And um, I think the first time they came back from Hamburg is when they played a, a gig at Litherland Town Hall here in um, Liverpool. And for people in Liverpool, that was the opportunity to observe the transformation. I mean, the fact that most people turned up to Littleton Town Hall that, 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 uh, that December, they thought the Beatles were from Germany. <laughs> That's right. That's true. And, and they, um, they just, I think they just blew everybody away. The people I've spoken to say, well, they came on, the curtains came back, good golly Miss Molly or long tall study, whatever it is that Paul sings, the crowd, instead of just being dispassionate and dancing, they rushed the stage and they couldn't believe these guys. And um, in, in a way, that was the beginning of the Beatles as we know them. And, and, and if you like Beatlemania, but, um, and of course, uh, one of the guys who played on stage that night was Chaz Newby. Yeah, but I interviewed Chaz. Yeah, well, Chaz now plays uh, with the Quarrymen. When the Quarrymen do gigs, which they still do, uh, Chaz plays bass. So if you get the chance to see the Quarrymen, you're also seeing an ex Beatle. Isn't that amazing there, Colin? I just got to say, before we go, please hold the book one more time and tell them where they can get it from. Well, you can get it on Amazon. Okay. Um, you can always let write to me. You, you can maybe give them my detail and I can send you a copy, but it would be a cheaper deal for people to buy it on Amazon. Okay. You can, you can get it on Kindle. But we get more money if you buy it as a solid copy. And if you have so a buy solid it as a copy, book, everybody. Yeah, if you buy it as a book, if you meet Col or I, we'll sign it, but we can't sign a Kindle. <laughs> I'd make them come to Liverpool to get it signed when they're there. And it's only 10 quid. We kept the price down. That's nothing. 10 quid is we, like $20. We see people, you know, um, selling books and they, they put the price up and, and we thought, no, we just want someone, something. Colin wanted this for his grandchildren. He said, in there, I'm going to tell it as it happened and not like people wish it had happened or have, have changed the stories. He said, I want it to, to, to set the record straight and for my grandkids to know what I did when I was a, a teenager. So we spent three years putting this book together and um, you know, it was a labor of love. We, we just had so much fun doing it. And I, I loved every minute writing it. Colin, I want to thank you from Plastic EP and... And thank you, Plastic. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again.